You're listening to We Deep in Media. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Deepen with Christina. I'm your host, Christina Weber, founder and CEO of We Deepen Feminine Weapon, and also a certified professional love coach. We Deepen supports you if you desire to have healthy, meaningful, loving relationships. Go to wedeepen.com and you will see all types of social and transformational experiences, whether you're currently single or you're in a relationship and you want to deepen that relationship with a significant other, or you want to find your tribe, you'll see those experiences. And you'll also see an opportunity to join our matchmaking database and schedule a discovery call. You know, it's interesting, this new offering of matchmaking and relationship coaching is so alive and exciting with inside of the organization right now, because we have a large network of of growth minded people who mm. want to live their lives to the fullest and they're willing to dive deep look at their shit transform learn from each experience and and be the best that they can be in every every moment this podcast follows my entrepreneur journey as I aim to shine light on the field of human connection. If you enjoy this podcast, please subscribe, like, follow, rate it. If you're listening on Spotify, see those little at the top, you can, um, you can five stars, <laughs> put, put that in there. I like five stars and this will help more people to find it and continue. And for me to continue to bring this podcast to you. Today, I'm going to dive, we're going to dive into a conversation around attachment theory, um, dating, also how to know that you are in the right relationship for you. I recently was introduced to Maya Diamond, who is an expert on attachment theory, erotic blueprint certified, and she helps people who are currently single on a daily basis to navigate their dating life. Prior to this podcast recording, I went online and I watched her TEDx talk and I wrote down tons of notes that we'll dive into. And I'm so excited because for me personally, I have been thinking about alignment of really how two people come and align and specifically you know, if you're generally what I find is that that age range of 30 to 45 is really when it's a time in, in somebody's life. That's like, I'm ready. <laughs> like I want to create a family and I I've seen so many relationships around me break uh, in Maya's Ted talk. She opens with that every 13 seconds, a couple in the United States is breaking up. And so if if this, if I if I think of the We Deep in Ecosystem, a bunch of growth-minded people, they're like, no, <laughs> I don't, I don't, I want to do this the right way, the the healthy way. And almost if if I can think of Maya as being like a doctor of love and relationships, which is what we have been missing in our society, our educational curriculums and neglect the subject. Most of us didn't grow up observing those healthy relationships. And, uh, and, and I, you know, in around alignment, this is not only in romantic relationships, of course, we do speak about that, but also in work, you know, there's oftentimes people are come together and want to start a company. And when they, and then the contention point shows up and when you really like you know, when you, when you actually have somebody else witnessing, this is why experts are so important. You know, you go to a doctor to help you navigate your health, to go to an expert on that subject matter, to help you assess the situation that you're currently um, experiencing and to see, see the, 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 the blockages because in, in love, we want to be together. Like we, we want to connect, um, and figure it out and work together. But sometimes, sometimes 
you, the, the answer is to, is to detach from one another. Um, and also, you know, we see a, a lot of things around like letting go, like, how do we, how do we, like, we want to be together, but it's not right. And how do we let go and realign in, in each of these moments? And so that's, it was alive for me in the work type scenario. And also as a best friend was over yesterday, I'll have her in a future episodes. You might know her very well. Um, she can dive into that, but she was over here yesterday and I was just looking at her and like, babe, you're just, you guys are unaligned and you can see it when oftentimes those, we start being like, they're a narcissist. They're selfish. The finger, the blaming starts happening. And so, yeah, Maya, welcome. Welcome to the mm. podcast. Welcome to Deep In with Christina. <laughs> Thank you. So, so wonderful mm. to be here. Uh, let's start with uh, how did you, like what, what inspired you to choose a career that I imagine was not present it to you as a child of like, Hey, you can grow up and be a, <laughs> a, a, a quote unquote doctor. Yeah. A doctor of love. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I think kind of the primary thing reason appeared and then so many other reasons kind of have appeared that are much deeper once I could see maybe the unconscious motivations. So the primary reason was I was life coaching and I was coaching on everything. And I felt like I could coach on anything I wanted to coach on because I felt like I could do it. It was, I was coaching on all the areas. They were all working for people. It was great. Then my friend was like, you have to niche. And I was like, oh, I don't want to niche. And then I was like, well, what could I talk about all day long and never get bored? And if you know the Enneagram, I'm an Enneagram 7. So I was like, never get bored, of course, right? So um, love and relationship was just so clearly what I wanted to talk about and think about all day long, every day. And so that was like kind of the initial impulse that was very clear from that question of like, you need to niche. What would you do if you had to niche? Um, but then kind of going deeper, it's definitely related to family of origin stuff, growing up with a mom who, you know, was in different relationships and not feeling totally met and hearing about that. And so I have this deep love for women and passion for women. And so seeing women fulfilled in love is like deeply nourishing to me, right? Partly probably because of seeing your mom, my mom, not totally nourished by love. Mm -hmm. Um, and then also, um, yeah, I can feel, whoa, that's a big one. Definitely feel that. And then also, um, yeah, growing up with my parents divorced and, um, you know, not, not in the healthiest relationship with each other. Mm. And then what was that transition like from being a life coach into becoming a relationship coach? It was very um, clearly the universe was like, yes, yes, yes. As soon as I niched, it was like everyone was sending me clients. Like I was creating, you know, dating events. Like it just, there was so much flow and yes from the universe that it felt really aligned. Yeah. You did dating events too? I didn't know this. Yeah. This is, this is... Oh, yeah. What did you learn from doing dating yeah, events? Yeah, when I was listening to your interview, I was like, oh, I remember all those dating events. Those are so fun. Uh, what was your question? What did you learn from doing dating events? Hmm. It's definitely edgy to, you know, edgy and a, a nice challenge to bring new people together and have them connect quickly. Um, but it's like a fun and fun and edgy little challenge. Um, let's see what else. Yeah. That you just don't know. Yeah. That it's good to have like kind of some criteria in terms of, so that there's some similarities in terms of age or passions or, you know, values. Mm. And, uh, gosh, the, the topic of dating events is, um, that's where I, you know, learned that for me personally, wow, mm. like, 
we're, we're this, this is messy. This is I thought I could just bring people into a room exactly. and live happily ever after. What's going on? Um, and I and I began to see, wow, there's like expectation and pressure and anxiety was showing yes. up into the space. Yes. And that's when I started to seek other you know, of, of started watching the t- relationship Ted talks and reading yeah. the books to try to understand how I can support because totally. getting into the room is just not, is not the answer. It's so much deeper. Yes, definitely. But I agree. One of the biggest challenges is that anxiety, that social anxiety that happens in dating events, because the best way to connect is to not have anxiety, to be relaxed, to be present, So then, but then with dating events, it kind of increases the anxiety and there's multiple people in a room. So it just, that's a lot for people. And how about the the stigma? Did you find, what years were you doing dating events? Um, Like 10 years ago. What about the stigma? Well, I found that there was, you know, 2014 is when I began and that was around the time Tinder was the new hot thing and people yeah. sort of downloaded the apps and more were swiping and online dating became like, that's the place to go. And I yeah. found that, you know, entrepreneurs were generally easy to convert over to come to a dating experience. Yeah. However, yeah. most other professionals are like, eh, who are these desperate people at the dating event? Yeah. Did, did you Definitely. come across that? Yeah, I think, well, with my clients, I see that a lot. Like it can be hard to get them to go to a speed dating event. Like I'll find a speed dating event. And sometimes it takes a lot of like, you know, support to get them there. Why do you think that is? I think there is that piece. I think one of the biggest things that is so frustrating in our culture is that there is so much shame around being single and it's really I don't know if I can swear on here, but you can swear. It's really fucked up. In my opinion, there should not be shame around being single. There shouldn't be a like marriage or being in a relationship is better than being single. It should just be like, they're both equally as important and valued. And in my opinion, and so the shame around being single, then to go to an event with multiple people where you're all single and you're looking for love, there's also shame around looking for love it's, there's something wrong somehow with looking for love when it's like, why, why should it be wrong to look for a relationship? Oh my God. There's so many things. Yes. Of, Oh, once you stop looking, you'll find him. Yes. <laughs> and it's like, wait, this Which is what contra- makes you feel bad if you're looking for it. Right. Cause that's like inherent in that phrase. Yeah. Yeah. And that's too, there's, there's a, a willingness to show up. And also even what I'm finding so amazing right now in, in the time that we're living, I think this was like, you know, a, the blessing and the curse of COVID is people came out and they're like, wow, I need help. Yes. Like I need support in this area of my life. It, it, yeah. It's not, you know, it, maybe it was initially innate as we were babies, but right. then with all the conditioning in the world and taking us away from it, it like we weren't given the skill set. And to see the, what I mm-hmm. actually see is people who are willing to reach out and and connect yeah. with the es- experts and work with coaches and show up at the yeah. dating experiences mm. are brave as fuck. Yes, definitely. hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. It's such uh, to, to say like, Oh, I don't have the skills that I need, or I don't have, or whatever I've been doing for the last 30 years is not working. Like I need something different takes a lot of courage, but also it takes a lot of courage to look at your shadow. And I think, you know, that's one of the things that I think is, you know, creates destructive patterns in your love life is the shadow and the unconscious and the trauma and the events in your past that have been, you know, kind of replaying then in your love life. So then to say, okay, I'm going to actually do the healing work. I'm going to look at that stuff. I'm going to rewire that stuff. That takes so much courage and bravery and not everyone's willing to do that work. Yes. And humbleness. I, yeah. at the ego gets so much in the way. I yeah. was uh, in a relationship from uh, 
March of this year, if you're listening, you might have heard that you can listen back to podcasts around between March and July when I um, entered a relationship and then exited a relationship. And Mm -hmm. when I left that relationship, I completely disengaged um, because there was a what what happened towards the end. He had this habit of stonewalling. And, Mm -hmm. you know, the the Gottman Institute speaks about the four horsemen. Yeah. kill a relationship and yeah. stonewalling is one of those. And oh, it's so painful. So, so painful to so, be on the other end of that. Yeah. So I left that relationship yeah. and just a couple of days ago, after four months of being completely disconnected from each other, I got, I got the text. I got the text that said, um, I checked in with how I was. Uh, he ran into some mutual friends of ours he said that I talked about our relationship on a stage at Unleash and he was, and, and cause they told him and it made him think of me and he realizes now, uh, or he wanted me to know that he was mm-hmm. truly in love with me, but his ego got in the way. Hmm. That's beautiful. Really beautiful. And yeah. sometimes too, I think that we like give space to let people to go through their own process to come yeah. to that conclusion of, wow, my ego is in the way. Cause that took four months, yeah. four yeah. months for him to go through. And, yeah. and I could have looked at that and, and, you know, at times and been like, wow, he's such a narcissist and, you know, tried mm-hmm. to stay and make it work. And, um, yeah. and I left, I left yeah. that, that relationship. Yeah. Which is really exactly courageous. It's courageous. We were talking earlier before the podcast started around how like sometimes ending a relationship is the best possible thing. And, but it also takes so much courage to say like, I love this person so much. They're so wonderful in so many ways. And I'm not getting my needs met. I need healthy communication skills. And this is my boundary. And to me, that's secure attachment, right? That's one of the biggest principles of secure attachment. Mm. And and also to this, I feel like there's sometimes a, a big confusion around love and relationship because, mm. and, and specifically in the, the quote unquote conscious community, mm. um, because it's, mm-hmm. if, if you're, as you're doing the transformational work, it's so easy to drop into love. Yeah. And then, and then, so then the love hooks you into the other. And then we try to yeah. make relationship work because we love that person. Yes. How does one, how does one really assess that they are in the right relationship? (laughs) That's a great question. Um, I think, um, I think that first question of like, is the person kind of related to what we're talking about? Is the person capable of meeting my needs in relationship? Is this person capable? Do they have the capacity to meet my needs in relationship? Asking yourself that question. If the answer is no, I would say that I would highly recommend not being with that person. Capacity is so, so important. And then, yeah, like, are we aligned in terms of our values, lifestyle, and our vision for the future? Do we want the same things in the same, around the same amount of time? Um, do we have a life that's really, we can really share together and do we have values? That is such an important piece, which is like, are our values aligned enough in the most important ways that we can really move forward in our lives together? Because if your values are not aligned, it's just going to keep coming up over and over again in relationship. And then also exactly like there's the capacity and then, yeah, is this person, someone might have the capacity, but they might not be available. So is this person available for the kind of relationship I desire? Mm. My, uh, my, my flatmate angel recently had said to me as I was assessing a relationship and he said, Clarity is kindness. Mm, beautiful. How does one, you I know, always we, say clarity is gold. So I love that. I've never heard the word clarity is kindness. That's great too. Clarity yeah. is gold as well. Yeah. How does somebody, you know, when, when you say of capacity to meet my needs, what's my vision? What are my values? 
some of these things are, you know, as we're moving through our everyday lives, we don't necessarily, sometimes we don't even know. <laughs> we're not even what these are. what these are. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Like a really great exercise is writing down, like, what are my relational needs? Like really, I remember doing that and it was just so helpful to just own it and claim it because that's the other piece again, in regards to attachment is so many of the attachment, the, the insecure attachment styles, disorganized, anxious, and avoidant are the insecure styles. There can be a disconnection from one's own needs. And so to claim your needs and to really know what they are and to own them in yourself and in relationship is such a powerful act. And so to have that clarity, then as you're dating, it's like you can quickly see, oh, this person like is not able to meet my needs. You know, as you get to know someone, it's it's actually pretty obvious when you're paying attention. Took me a very long time to learn how to do that but it's very obvious from the get-go. I love that of, of claiming your needs. I, in a recent podcast, mm -hmm. uh, Relationship Renegades episode uh, 56, for those who are listening, is a great episode with um, Rachel Brooksmith and um, Emilio. They're a couple who is newly married and mm. they have one of those relationships that um, people look at and they are like, I mean, come on, is that really possible for us? They're like the, nice. these like stars and um, people listen to that podcast and there was all types of feelings that brought up for him, them. Um, some people are like, like vomits, like th that's not realistic. Like that's, we, we can't have that. Mm. And, um, and a couple of the things that, that Rachel spoke about, I'll, I'll, the first one is really the having like this deep, belief of what was possible for her. Yeah. And, yeah. and the second thing is when they were, uh, when they were first meeting at the end of uh, the, the full day that they had spent together, Emilio mm -hmm. had asked to kiss her mm -hmm. and she said, no, uh -huh. uh, because she had, was, she was newly out of a, um, an mm. old former relationship that she was moving through and healing from. And Emilio said in that moment, when she said no, that he liked her more. Yeah, totally. He started to trust her because yep. she claimed her boundaries and her needs. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent makes complete sense because she was knowing who she was at that moment, what she needed, what she was available for. And exactly, of course, that makes you feel like, oh, I can trust this person is not going to just people please and just make me feel good so that, you know, we can be in harmony in the relationship. It's like, no, I'm going to say what's true for me, even if it causes pain in the other, because I know that that's real intimacy. The work that we get to do to be, to, to be in love, to, to really to be, be in an healthy relationship. Yes. And to be that attuned to yourself. I think attunement is one of the keys to healthy relationship and healthy sex. And so when you're really attuning to yourself and you're feeling what's true for you, then you can, ex then of course, hopefully you can express it or do the work to be able to express it, but also being able to attune to the other person and what they're needing and feeling and to be able to listen to that, right? His response then was, I can tell just from your, the story was like a yes to her boundary, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so when someone's a yes to, first of all, that's one of the narcissism, right? Nar being in a relationship with a narcissist is awful. And here's one of the biggest reasons why is because they have, a, they basically are a no to your boundaries, which means they're not actually respecting your wholeness, right? And so when someone is a yes to your boundaries, that also then makes her feel more safe. I can have my boundaries here and be respected. Yeah. And as that word narcissist gets thrown around, they may not yes. even be a narcissist. You might've claimed that for them yes. to help you categorize and be like, oh, but you hadn't claimed your boundaries. Exactly. 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 
Now I know and narcissism is a real thing also. <laughs> Just want to say that because I think it's really important to say. Yeah. Yeah. It is. It is a real thing. Uh, Dr. Ramani, who has um, spoken at We Deepen experiences before we had her speak at a talk nerdy mm. to me. And I have her record it. And I share that often with people who have very, there's very similar patterns that happen in narcissistic relationships yeah. and the yeah. book of, um, should I stay or should I go? How to survive a relationship with a narcissist is Dr. Ramani's. She's, oh, nice. she's on a crusade. Wonderful. And she says that, uh, you know, her, she sees a, a, about 30% of the population of the population are, are, mm -hmm. are narcissists and that don't quote me on that, but like that might be in Los Angeles alone because right. Los Angeles, it's, there's more, there's more there. <laughs> yeah. It makes wait, lots of sense. So there'd be more there. Yeah. So I know you're um, an, an expert in attachment theory mm -hmm. and I first discovered attachment theory in probably about 2016. I right. had, um, I had a, I had a breakup and I was trying to process through what happened and who was I showing up in that relationship. And someone gave me Amir Levine's attachment theory book. Attached. Attached. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I read that and I came to the conclusion after that, oh, he's an avoidant. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's now married. Uh, mm -hmm. He married the next girl after and he's been with her for, I think, four or five, six years um, since the mm -hmm. end of that one. So then it kind of makes me question, is he really avoidant? Did I make that up? Because I, I, I need it to want to hear my thoughts on that. Yeah. So just because someone's married doesn't mean it's a happy relationship. So that's number one that I think is important for anyone to know, which is just because someone's able to be in a long-term relationship and or able to be married doesn't mean that it's healthy or happy. So I think that's one thing just for your psyche to think about. And then exactly, we have no idea. It might be super happy and healthy. We just don't know unless you're within that relationship. And so all of the, the, the attachment styles, uh, mm -hmm. anxious, avoidant, uh, mm -hmm. secure, I believe there's even more attachment styles outside of those three yeah. Also, I want to add one other thing to what I just said, which is the other thing is someone could be avoidant and then they partner with someone who's like, you know, somehow just works with their particular attachment style in the most particular fantastic way possible. Right. And so, for example, maybe that person doesn't need a lot of emotional responsiveness for example, that or a lot of quality time together, or they, the other person also needs a lot of space. or the other person is also avoidant. Like, so there's just so many different combinations that can work with people that you just, I think the most important thing for that relationship is like, it didn't work for you. And that's all that matters. Mm. Yeah. And, and, and we, and we could, if I was coaching you, we could list all the reasons why it didn't work for you. And that's what you have to hold on to because that's the truth because your own experience, your own authentic experience is truth. That's your truth. And that's real. And I could see if, if you were coaching me in this moment, I went back into that relationship of, of 2016. I, I know that relationship didn't work because of who I was in that relationship. Right. There's also who you were. Exactly. So there's like both and happening. Totally. And yeah. and who I was, because I saw your video on, uh -huh. you were speaking about uh, vulnerability community or vulnerable communication in yes. a recent Instagram yes. post. Mm -hmm. And that was my challenge at that time. It was yeah. around that 2016 was when Brene Brown began to be popular or yes. was coming popular. It was actually, I think that relationship happened before I discovered her. And, yeah. and in my first, my first thoughts of when I discovered the idea of vulnerability, it was, it was like, okay, I go back into my past and I share all the hardships and challenges right. that I went through totally. in the past. Totally. Totally. I did. I, I did have that too. Yeah, like, that's what vulnerability means. You talk about the past things. Yeah, <laughs> not no. in the real yeah. time. And yeah. so, in, in that yeah. relationship of, um, I I believe 
I was an anxious, I was an, I, I had, you were more anxious. I was attached. definitely uh-huh. more anxiously attached. And, yeah. um, he, oh, I could, I, I'll, I guess I'll, I wasn't expecting to share this story, but I'll, I'll share of, um, yeah. we had met on Tinder and it was around the time that I began producing dating experiences Hmm. And I was living in New York City. He was uh, a startup founder. Um, he had, this is a man who had developed 54 companies by the age of, Whoa. by the age of 39. Wow. And we had this really beautiful encounter on our first date in New York City. He put the, um, he was working in virtual reality and he put the headset on me and I went into, you know, the, the, the future of, um, <laughs> of technology. And at the end of this first meeting, he said, or during it, he said, wow, you're to me. Cause I had all these ideas. He said, you're, um, you have such great ideas. I'm going to have to give you shares of my company. I was like, Oh, you know, I've heard this before. Don't, don't say that. Like, that's, that's great. And we carried on with the dinner Well, he left and he went to like eight different countries to focus on building his company. And about a month later, I got an email with a share offering. Or actually before that, I got mm-hmm. a, a message from him saying, what's your email address? And I said, are you sending me anything good? He said, yes, shares in my company. And then an hour later, I got a message CC'd with his, with the um, <laughs> legal team and was given shares in the company. Wow. Wow. And then I continued producing these dating events, but I couldn't get the man out of my wow. head who came into my life and gave me shares. It believed in me so much that gave me shares in his company and right. me being, uh, you know, had left at this point, you know, I'd left corporate America, the salary job. I had this mm-hmm. idea of, you know, building this company and here he was had all this experience and I was like a first time entrepreneur. I knew nothing and he knew everything. And, um, right. And then, uh, um, um, I think that there's a little shock in me as I'm telling the story, but it's, uh, uh, he, during when the holidays rolled around, I was like, I need to, I need to get this crush off my chest. Like I've got to do something. So I wrote him and I said, Hey, do you ever wonder what if, and he responded like, it was a like Christmas Eve and he responded, yes. And when we met up by the time it worked out, he came to New York city and we met back up and we spent a long weekend together and it happened to be Valentine's day weekend. Oh my gosh. Now at the time, um, romantic. The, just the, a little the, romantic, just a little note. And at the time, the, um, the New York times article of the, about the 36 questions had came out. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. It's like, if you want to fall in love, do this. And there is these 36 questions that uh, social social psychologists had created to accelerate closeness amongst strangers. And so that weekend, we played the 36 questions over a three-day period of time. And I was smitten. Yeah. And then he left. And when he left, he, um, I had remembered seeing a picture of a child on his, on his, Hmm on his Facebook. And there I was, I spoke a lot about my niece and he never mentioned this child. Hmm. And rather than asking him, Hey, who's the child on your Facebook page? Yes. Instead, I went to Google Uh just to figure it out on my own. And I started researching and searching because I'm like, oh, I don't want to intrude and ask him who the child was. <laughs> well, instead, right. I'll research it. <laughs> I've researched it. I then like found an ancestry report and it linked him to a child and linked him to a wife. And I was like, what is happening? Uh, mm. And I never asked. And I just kept, then I would go back and we would come back together and I would be like, hey, do you have any secrets? that you want to share. Wow. And so this went on for about a five month period of time because we were long distance from each other until one day that I had to have like four drinks to open up and be like, Hey, do you have a child? And he's like, yeah, "Yeah, I do. And I was like, were you married? And he's like, 
I was, I was married. I told you about that relationship, but we, we ended. So he had, his ex was, um, his ex was using the child against him and Mm. it became a sore spot for him. So he Mm. wasn't openly sharing it. And I interpreted and he'd also had told me at one point that he wanted to take things slow. So I was withholding. He couldn't, I mean, he couldn't trust me because I was exactly, we were, we were just speaking on different languages. And and so I I see that's why it ended for me. Totally. First of all, being too scared because also the vulnerability is like yes too fearful to ask the questions exactly and so this is a perfect example of the anxious attachment like I'm gonna shape shift myself so that I can stay in connection instead of just speaking my need which is I actually have a need for clarity around this I have a need to know if you have a child or not I'm curious about it and if this and you I think something that's very true about people with anxious attachment who run more anxious is a lot of times they're also empaths. And so you can pick up, you might've been unconsciously picking up his kind of fear of discussing it. And so then you were not also, that was contributing to you not speaking it. And so what we have to do as empaths, because I'm empath and definitely a highly sensitive person, not as HSP as a lot of people I know, but definitely have a lot of HSP, which is like, you have to kind of own like, okay, like I'm having all this, like maybe fear of saying this because it might be hard for them. (laughs) And I might be picking that up, but that doesn't matter. I'm going to stay in my healthy, true sense of self and say the thing even if it's scary, even if they don't like it, even if it triggers them, et cetera. Right. And that's that like fully actualized self that is secure attachment. Mm -hmm. And so exactly like, so I can look through my dating history as well. And there were so many moments where I didn't say the thing because I was so afraid of triggering the person or hurting the person or the relationship ending. I think for me, that was one of the biggest fears was the fear of abandonment, the fear of something ending like the, like, Oh no, I like and love this person so much. So therefore I'm not going to say the thing because otherwise it will end now instead of later. (laughs) Recapping that story. It, it, it helps for me to even realize my own growth over the years yes. and yes now learning Beautiful. from that experience like never again will I never not ask the question yes. will yes. I never not be myself yes exactly so so huge and so I mean I, I want to drive home like I think one of the pieces that we're both relating to around this is so connected to women's empowerment and being a woman because there's a whole huge conditioning that women have around, you know, being the good girl, being nice, not causing any waves, not speaking up in class, even in saying what we feel and want and think in class, right? And so there's just so many ways that we're oppressed and suppressed in our society through harassment, through violence, through all these different things. And so to, to speak up around these things, it's all connected to that, to that like kind of conditioning and patriarchal conditioning that we've been a part of for so long. And the reason I say this, I say this with serious wisdom. Like I've literally worked with thousands of women at this point. And there's threads of similarities are remarkable, right? This thread of not speaking what the truth is in relationship to the man who for thousands, so many years, right? Women were literally dependent. Their survival was dependent on it. So there's so many like layers to this piece. It's not just attachment. In my opinion, it's also conditioning Mm. for women. Mm. And so if you're a woman listening, I just want to give compassion, right? So it's really important to have compassion for this part of you because it's so much bigger than just you. Mm. And thank you for giving me that piece around 
being like a, an empath in that moment of sensing that something yeah. was off because I yeah. could go and shame myself as I look back yeah. into it and be like, what were you doing? You weren't speaking up. Exactly. Why weren't you you sharing? But where there's so many different energetics at play um, that are creating the situation and the scenario that yeah. um, are hard to yes. process in that moment. And, and looking back yeah. at hindsight, we can see it all. Um, but in the moment, as you're yeah. going through it, these hooks that are, you know, because we really want it. We want to be together. We want. Um, right. You wanted the intimacy, wanted the connection. You wanted the, the like all of that with this person. And at the same time, I'm sure there was a fear of if I say this, what will happen? Yes. And, and so you, you bring up, I, um, women, yes, oppressed and, um, you know, like all, all, all of the, um, I guess the, the, the challenges that come from that experience and, you know, with, um, have you seen the, the documentary, the red pill? No, I haven't. Should it's, I? It's fa- yes, yes. Mm, cool. It's fascinating because um, uh-huh. I'm I'm blanking on her name, but she it's a really fascinating documentary. Mm-hmm. But she went in; she was a big feminist, and she went into um, mm. like talk to the men these these men groups like McTow, which are men go their own way, or these groups that are disengaging from women because the men are like mm. you know. Uh, there's also men who have felt in the. Um, in the legal system, when mm-hmm. they are going through separation, specifically around children, that they are shamed and pushed away and know the, the woman is the, yeah. the woman wins always. Right. Right. And, um, and what she discovered was just so, you know, just, it, it, it's, it's very informative of their experience as well of how the whole system isn't set up yeah. for either of us to win. And yeah. Dr. Avron Rice, who he did, um, and I did an episode with him on why, why men are afraid of women. Mm, mm. And he's a, a psychologist in his sixties. Mm. So he's mm-hmm. been in the field for decades upon decades. And he mm. has this message. His book is called hidden in plain sight, how men's mm. fears of intimacy are driving or men's fears of women are driving their intimate relationships. Yeah. That makes and, total sense. Yeah, of their, you know, their, their, a lot of times I see that they're, I, when, when women tell me these situations, I'm like, oh, do you see he's, he's actually scared of you. He's lying because he's scared to tell you the truth. Yes, exactly. And that's the people pleasing thing that I think happens. What I've seen in my work, because I work with men also is that people pleaser or that, that drive for men to make women happy, which I th- I believe is like kind of a biological drive. I think it's very mass. I mean, I think there's, yeah, the masculine essence, but also maybe biology as well to make a woman happy, to give her pleasure, to make her feel good. It's just so healthy, I think for a man. And then if, so then he might be afraid of speaking his vulnerable truth because then it's going to disappoint her. Right. And they don't want to disappoint her. They didn't want to disappoint their mother, all of that. And so exactly like I know I was driving home that point around women having a hard time speaking their truth. Same with men, right? For different reasons. It's like there's so many ways that people in general are afraid to speak the truth because if there's because we're all you know, there's an amazing book called Getting Real by Susan Campbell, who really teaches authentic communication and relationships. And um, yeah, she talks about how there's just so many ways that our communication is trying to control rather than relate. So Mm -hmm. I'm not going to speak my truth because I'm actually trying to control the relationship by not saying what's true, not being, not, not being real and intimate because I don't want to create disharmony in the relationship. Mm. And that's actually controlling and not relating. Mm. And so that's definitely been one of my biggest things that I've had to work on, I think. And again, I want to bring compassion if you're listening, because I know for me that came from like trauma from like 
almost from pre-verbal trauma. So like, so, so there can be a trauma that has happened in your childhood or in your babyhood or in your young adulthood that makes it so to speak something feels, you know, life-threatening or feel to speak something into the space that is, um, you know, that might create some disharmony or might create someone not liking it can be so scary to the nervous system. And so that's why the work I do with my clients, we're actually healing those traumas, healing those memories, healing those events so that the speaking can come more naturally and more fluidly. Mm. I love that you've also brought in the men wanting to make women happy. Yes. There was a, in, in 2015, so January 30th is Feminine mm-hmm. Weapon Day. It's a day to honor conscious light and beautiful self. I started this movement, Feminine Weapon, back in uh, mm. 2013, 2014. January 30th was the first annual Feminine Weapon Day. And so the, mm. the 10th annual Feminine Weapon Day is coming up in, uh, oh, in nice. 2023 on January 30th. And so far, we've raised over... 75,000 for children of abuse, extreme poverty and human trafficking, also wow. children in the the foster system awesome. to receive art and healing programs and education wow. um, similar to the the programs that we're providing grownups um, mm-hmm. around love and connection to bringing those yeah. to the children. Yeah. Well, in 2018, uh, there was each year there's a theme for Feminine Weapon Day and that year it was our year five. And that Mm. year, the theme that came through was for the love of men. Mm. Mm -hmm. And I wanted, you know, Mm. as I was, this was like October, November of 2017. And because it was year five and all the themes in previous years had been focused on the women, like we had a tribe Mm -hmm. of women that would come together and produce this event. And I realized that, wow, like each year, the men show up. They, they, I negotiate all the venues with them. They're Mm. the backline band for the most part. Mm. They are the photographer. They play these key roles. They buy 50% of the tickets. And so this year I wanted to celebrate them. Mm, Beautiful. And what unfolded at the same time, just months later was then me too and time's up. And then I got bullied, (laughs) majorly bullied Mm. online Mm. for for wanting for the love of man to coexist or not even necessarily wanting. I felt like it was a divine channel that it just happened. And then that unfolded at at the same time. And and so I I prayed it around this idea that man's life purpose is to make women happy and women are to wholeheartedly love men. Mm -hmm. And I got so much pushback from that theory that I was prading around. Yeah. Um, Yeah. And even, even my uncle, who's a gay man was like, Mm -hmm. like really, really Christy. And I was like, well, uncle David, I see the way that you show up for grandma, your mom, like you do anything and everything for her. And he was like, okay, okay. And I, I can see it in the way that when, you know, I know this, I know women hated this is a thing that like, you know, when a woman's walking on the street and then I'm like, smile, you look so beautiful when you smile, you know, that, that yeah, shout out to totally, the men on the street. Totally. And yeah. then it bothers us. We're like, fuck you. Like, we don't want to smile. We don't have, we can, to, smile. We, we don't have yeah. to smile. But they're really, that's what they crave. Yeah. They're, they're craving us to be in joy and excitement yeah. and ecstasy. Mm-hmm. ecstasy. And yeah. that what provides them with pleasure. Exactly. I mean, totally. even so much, the man's body is designed yes. to make a woman happy. And I'm not taking anything exactly. away from the gay experience. No, that, yeah. that is yeah. like, you can, pleasure can come in all forms of way, but like those bodies were made. Yeah. I mean, that's how babies are born. That's how we're procreated. And, and yes, come into yes. This if you're heterosexual, exactly. Then your body is designed for that. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Or even for yeah. procreation too. I mean, 
that's what it is. A, 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 a gay couple goes out and adopts a children or, or has a, a child, for it, but that's, they're essentially creating that experience that is the man and the woman coming together. Right. It's, it's right. impregnating yeah. and having a baby. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what's the response that you see from men when you bring that to their attention? <laughs> Well, I don't really have to bring it to their intention in terms of my clients. It's, it's con- my male clients. It's constantly like in the field, right? So we're con- the clients I work with. Most of the men that I work with are constantly managing that desire are constantly in relationship with that desire to make their women happy. And so a lot of the work, you know, recently, for example, with the one client, it's like, how can he speak his needs, desires, and boundaries? How can he have those boundaries like we've been talking about earlier so that he doesn't run over his boundaries, is completely unhappy in the relationship, right? And then it may be making her happy, but then he's not happy, right? Mm -hmm. So it's constantly just in the field when I work with clients is this piece. And so... Yeah. Another thing that I'm super passionate is masculine, feminine dynamics, which is kind of like very connected to this piece that we're talking about. Mm. So in in dating, you know, it's uh, with men having this, you know, desire to make women happy and they're dating and they're aiming to find a person to Mm -hmm. spend a you know, to create a family with or choose one person. And And I would say, I think something important about what you just said is most men, I I notice a big um, theme, which is most men are looking for a really good connection. And most women are looking for like their life partner. I would say on a whole, if I had to make a, a generalization. And so I think that's just something important for once I realized that it actually helped me understand men better. I was like, Oh, this is the most like, they're like, sure. Like maybe, yeah, like I'll commit, you know, maybe, but like, this is the most important thing that they have the longing for. I've what I've seen is like the predominant longing for men is a really good connection. That's interesting. I, I, and what, what would you say then about a man who is in a space in his life where he's thinking about family. Yes. I think for those men, exactly. I think they're definitely like, okay, I'm ready for family. I want to find my partner so we can have a family. I would just say that I think that's a, a small percentage of men are in that category. And what I see is it's more women who are clear about that. And then men who are like, yeah, that sounds great. Now that we have this great connection and we're having a great life together. Mm. I think there's more of that going on. I think there's definitely men who are clear that they want a family and they want marriage. And there's a lot of, and, but they're not, as I would say they're not as obsessed with it, which again, comes down to conditioning. They're we not are in. taught, we are literally taught from a very young age still that who we are is dependent on who we're with. So, Yeah. It seems so that then we're in a predicament Mm -hmm. because of, so I recently heard of a a, a story of there's a a man and he wants to, he wants to create, he wants to be in a long-term relationship Mm -hmm. and along the way he wants connection. He wants practice and to experience intimacy. And so he's getting in these situations where neither of them are speaking their truth about the connection. He's mm. connecting with a woman and he mm-hmm. knows that he doesn't see the a future, lot, with, a future her. Yes. Her, with her. Yes. But he Men, doesn't want to tell yes. her that because if he tells yes. her that, he knows he'll yeah. lose her. And yes. so, and she isn't saying anything because she does want a long term connection, but and she doesn't, she doesn't want, want to lose him. So she doesn't bring it up because she can feel that it's probably going to end the relationship, like what I was saying. She can feel it exactly. But what's true exactly is if they're both in the highest integrity, in my opinion, and they're both really caring for each other and caring for themselves, then they're, then he can just be like, 
yes, I really like you. I really like our connection. This would be the highest integrity man thing to do in my opinion, which is, I really like you. I really love our connection and I don't see a future with you. I don't know why it's just this feeling I get. I'm open to that changing if he is, but I just don't see a future. And so I do want to date other people, but I'm really excited to keep going with this lovership or this, you know, friends with benefits thing that we have going. I think it's wonderful. I feel like we have so much to offer each other, so many gifts to offer each other, but I don't see this as a long-term thing. You are literally, when you, man, men, when you say that to a woman, you're literally giving them so much of a huge gift mm. because then they're not exactly like attaching or putting all their eggs in that basket when it's not the right basket for them. And so for the woman to say, so uh, women, the woman could also say, I really like you. I'm really enjoying our connection. I'm curious, like, do you see this going somewhere? Can you see this, a vision of us together for the long term? And that's both of them taking responsibility for their lives and their relationship. Yes. How do, how do you, should they speak to the why? The why of why he doesn't see it and why um, I think he doesn't have to, I think he can, he, if sh he can like be asked about it, but I don't think he has to, I think it's, I don't think it really, I think it's either. I don't think it matters. So he could, or he couldn't, but either way, I think he should be open to sharing it. So if mm -hmm. she wants to know it, then yes. I, uh, I did one of those reality TV shows. Oh, yeah. It was, uh, I did. Yeah. Um, last year it was, it's called X rate it, uh, on it's on the Peacock network, uh, okay. hosted, hosted by Andy Cohen. Yeah. And I Amazing. am one, one of the eight episodes and the premise of the show, there was a woman who would go on dates and she would send feedback forms. Oh, nice. Awesome. And so that's the premise of the show of, um, I, you know, enrolled three of my exes to do this with me and we all oh filled. God. Yes, I know. Yes. <laughs> they, they filled out surveys and rated me in the areas of affection, intimacy, um, okay. initiation, hygiene, all types of spontaneity. Wow. Wow. And I rated myself in those areas as well. And then publicly we came together and they re they revealed the results oh with Andy Cohen <laughs> um, and it was it's an interesting process because there i you know the idea was to get the feedback but i don't know if the, the sometimes yeah i did that once i did a workshop um that was that where we had i had to send to three of my exes like a feedback form about me and the relationship it was a little bit helpful it was helpful. I mean, mostly I had, I already knew because they had told me, but it was still like a, it was a definitely a vulnerable experience and not having it videotaped and on TV. <laughs> People can go watch it. Go to P the Peacock a Network. Thousand in times. X rated. The episode is called the relationship guru who can't find love. Oh my gosh. Wow. <laughs> That is, you are very courageous. Talk about courage, girl. That's what you, amazing. What do you think about ghosting? Oh, I, I mean, to me, it's just really low level, low consciousness level behavior. I think it takes courage and I don't think it's that hard to send a text and say, I really enjoyed our connection, but I just don't think we're a romantic fit. I wish you the best in the future. I just think that's so basic human behavior and, and a lot of people don't have those words. That's why I'm just saying them out loud because a lot of people just don't have those words and they need the words. And then they're like, Oh yeah, that's easy. I can do that. Mm. Um, but I think again, it, again, that people pleasing, like I'm afraid to hurt this person's feelings. So I'm not going to say the thing, but then by not saying the thing, you're actually creating more harm and pain. That's actually a theme in this conversation that we've gone over multiple times. Mm. Like by not saying the thing, you're creating more disconnection, more harm, more pain. Mm. And, and, you know, as we're connecting on a larger scale these days with dating apps and social media, you know, I've heard there's this thing around, oh, well, if you go on one date, you don't have to say anything. Just 
you know, just don't ever respond again and you're good. Would you? Well, there's a, let's fine tune that. So yeah. there's, you could go on a date and then nobody texts each other after. You could go on a date and then the guy or someone texts you and then you don't respond. Those are two very different things. Mm. So what are you referring to? Well, I love that you you made that 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 differentiation. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think if, if you go on a date and both people don't say anything after, you're golden. But if that's not ghosting. Yeah, that's not, I agree. That's yeah. not ghosting. <laughs> yeah. Great. Yeah. 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 Um, but if somebody reaches out yes. afterwards and nothing is said, then that is ghosting. Ghosting. And it's not okay. That's not ethical behavior, in my opinion. That's not conscientious. That's not kind. That's not humane. And I highly recommend just sending a quick um, text and just saying, I really enjoyed this and this about the date, or I really enjoyed this and this about you starting it off with a couple of compliments is so helpful. And my gut is saying, we're not a romantic fit. I wish you the best. I'll, I'll, be, I'll always be happy if we are, I'll be happy to see if we bump into each other in the future. If that's true, you can say that as well. Mm. Yeah. Wow. You are um, a, a depth of wisdom when it comes to love and relationships. Mm -hmm. We had an intention for this podcast to have fun in dialogue. And I, this, this has been a fun conversation. Um, I think I, I feel a little perspiration under my, um, uh, my pits of being like, oh my God, I shared a lot. <laughs> like went into a lot of subjects here. Yeah. Before we wrap, is there anything, um, and we'll get into your work, but is there anything that you mm -hmm. want to make sure if you could give mm -hmm. one nugget to people about as they're navigating their relational journey, what is it yeah. that you really want them to know? Well, I think we, we started talking about attachment. We didn't really get to go into it as much as we could have. And so I'll just share exactly like if you're predominantly in one of the insecure styles, anxious, disorganized or avoidant are the terms that I like to use, but there's a ton of other terms that mean the same thing. Um, you know, that there is really hope that you really can rewire your nervous system, your brain, your um, attachment system so that you can behave and act and feel in a more secure way in a relationship and have more secure relationships. And it literally can be can make all the difference. If you're feeling like you don't know why these patterns keep happening, they're usually related to attachment. Nine times out of 10, they're related to attachment. I think this is a good time to share about your course. Okay. Awesome. Because <laughs> I was going to so, say, what did they do? <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So yeah, so exactly. So I've been studying attachment you know, styles and work vary for um, about 15 years. And um, my course is called Empower Love. And it's a four month course where we do the deep healing work to really transform and heal your attachment style so that you can become more secure, but also teach you exactly how to date in a healthy way that actually works and is effective. And also really deeply goes into uh, cultivating your feminine energy and radiance if you're in the women's course. So there's a there's a program for women and then for men right now, there's also a program and it's one on one with me. Um, the program for women is a group program. And then you can also do the, the uh, one on one VIP package if you wanted to just work with me one on one. Um, so, yeah. That, and I would love to offer that to your community at a 15% discount for anyone who's like really interested and excited to jump in. Amazing. Thank you so much. And you can mention We Deep End when you do apply for those programs or when you have that conversation with the team over at Empower Love. And I believe that they can go directly to empowerlove.com. Stop. Yeah. So the best way, if you're really interested in the program is to go to empowerlove.us forward slash apply and apply for a free love breakthrough session. And then it'll be like a discovery call where we're going to find out kind of where you are now, what are your blockages, where you want to go and see if you're a great match for the program. We're working with me one-on-one. -on -one. 
Amazing. Thank you so much. And we'll we'll definitely include that in the description of the podcast so you can link straight to Maya Diamond's work and Empower Love. Thank you, Maya, for all you're doing in the world. This is, yeah. I believe, the most important uh topic for us to be discussing as humanity mm. if we want to elevate and live harmonious lives. Mm. Thank you. It's been such an honor and pleasure to connect with you and talk with you today. Ditto. And thank you all for listening to another episode of Deepen with Christina. A reminder, if you do enjoy this podcast, please do like, subscribe, follow, rate, share it with your friends. Specifically, if this podcast was episode was good for you, imagine what friends uh, would, would this information be helpful to as well. Yes. And I also just want to add one thing, which is I have a podcast called rewire your attachment style. So if you're wanting to go deeper into this, I also have couple interviews with high functioning couples. We talked about these couples that are like, wow, relationships can be like this. So that's kind of one of the themes of the shows so that you can listen to high functioning, evolving conscious couples talk about their relationship. Oh, I love that. It sounds like a bunch of relationship role models. Yeah, exactly. Thank you all for tuning in and until next time, love you. Bye.